Welcome back everyone, Houston Math Prep here just doing basic integration using reverse derivative formulas. So a couple of things that we've mentioned so far in our previous video on the power rule for integration. Since the derivative of a constant is zero, we know that from derivatives, then the antiderivative of zero with respect to x should just be some constant. We also remember that because the derivative of x to some power is we multiply out front by the power and then subtract one in the power. Our antiderivative formula, our power rule for integrals, is the opposite process in the opposite order. So we add one to the exponent and then we divide by that new power, making sure that we put our plus c on the end, the constant of integration. We'll go ahead and work through some other antiderivative formulas just using reverse of integration here. So the antiderivative of e to the x dx, we say, what function do we remember from derivatives gives us e to the x? And the answer is e to the x itself. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x, so the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x plus a constant, of course. We always want to remember our constant of integration. And we mentioned at the end of the last video something that looks like a power rule, but actually remember the derivative of what gives us 1 over x, and the answer was ln of x. So we say ln of x plus our constant here, and we just mentioned here that these functions don't have the same domain. I can only take logs of positive numbers, but I can take reciprocals of positive and negative numbers. We go ahead and put an absolute value here when we're doing the antiderivative. And again, the idea with that is just that all of the domain of logs are in the domain of 1 over x, but not all of the domain of 1 over x is in the log function. Let's just go ahead and apply some of our reverse derivative formulas for trig functions as well. When we ask what formula gives you a derivative of sine x, the answer is actually negative cosine x for that one. So negative cosine x plus c. The antiderivative of cosine x dx, well, the derivative that gives us cosine x is actually sine x. The derivative of sine x is cosine x. So plus c there. We may also remember a function whose derivative is secant squared x. The antiderivative of secant squared x would be tangent of x plus c because the derivative of tangent x is secant squared x. Similarly, we should know a derivative that gives us something that looks like cosecant squared x. Now the derivative of cotangent x is actually negative cosecant squared x. So the antiderivative of cosecant squared x is actually negative cotangent x. We're off by a sign there, right? Okay, and our last two here, the antiderivative of secant x tangent x, we should know that that is the derivative of secant x, I think. When we take the derivative of secant x, we get secant x tan x. And when we complete a derivative that gives us something like cosecant x cotangent x, think about the derivative of cosecant x is actually negative cosecant x cotangent x, the opposite sign of what we get here. So the antiderivative of this is actually negative cosecant x plus c. And looking at our last three here, you might recognize these as inverse trig definitions for derivatives. So what gives us a derivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared? That would be the inverse sine function, so inverse sine of x plus c here. The derivative of inverse sine of x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. For this next one here, the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx, that is the definition of derivative for inverse tangent of x there. So this antiderivative would be inverse tangent. And this last one here looks really similar, except we're missing maybe some absolute value that you might have recognized before. The antiderivative of 1 over x times the square root of x squared minus 1 would actually be inverse secant if we had the absolute value there right outside here. So this is actually the antiderivative of the absolute value of secant x plus your constant. And this one here, again with the secant, that just has to do with the sine of the slope in quadrant 2 for inverse secant x. So we get a similar thing where we start with no absolute value, but we end up with an absolute value when we take the antiderivative of this statement that gives us inverse secant. Okay, hopefully that was a quick trip down derivative memory lane for you. Just now thinking in reverse. Next up in our series, we start talking about some properties of these indefinite integrals. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you then.